A retiring justice of the Supreme Court, Musa Datijo Muhammad, who reportedly withdrew from the seven-man panel that dismissed all the appeals that sought to remove Tinubu from office, has accused the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Ulukayo de Ariwola, CDN, a CGN, of abusing the powers of his office. Justice Muhammad, who spent 47 years in active judicial service, bowed out of the APS court bench on Friday, having clocked the 70 years mandatory retirement age. He used the opportunity of the valedictory session that was organized in his honor by the Supreme Court to address what he observed as rot in the judiciary that have continued to affect the justice delivery system in the country. He maintained that the judiciary as presently structured gives so much power to the CJN, who he said usually takes decisions without consulting other justices. As we review Justice Musa Datijo Muhammad's valedictory speech, which continues to generate interest among lawyers and non-lawyers, is Ulisa Agbakoba, a senior advocate of Nigeria, our first guest today. Good morning, Mr. Agbakoba, and thank you for joining us. Well, good morning, Ruben. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Bye. Good to see you again. Well, Mr. Bakova, what stands out for you in that uh, valedictory uh, speech uh, by Justice Datijo Muhammad? Uh, in all of the points he raised about what he called the absolute powers of the uh, of the uh, CJN, his call for reform of the judiciary and its allegations of corruption uh, within the judiciary. Uh, do you think? the moment of his uh, valedictory speech was the appropriate occasion uh, to attack the CJN, <laughs> attack the same institution that he had served for about 47 years. Mm. Right. I, I, I will just start by correcting you, Ruben. Mm. Uh, that teacher's a very good friend of mine. He re really wasn't attacking the current CJN. He was, he was referring more to the institutional lapses that has occurred over the last, uh, God knows how long now. This is the current, uh, this current CJN is number 18. The first CJN of Nigeria was Foster Sutton in 1955. And uh, I can say that from 55 to about, say, the early 70s, 80s, the judiciary was fairly well, if badly wrong. Problem with judges is that they have no clue as to judicial administration versus administration of justice. The two things, judicial administration. So during the uh, military years, there was this consensus, even with the bar, that we needed to protect the judiciary and therefore something called the Advisory Judicial Council, the predecessor to the NJC was created and that enabled the bar and the bench to keep away the military from interference. And when we had the constitution, it became the NJC. Pro I think the big problem was that the judges didn't understand the need to strengthen and institutionalize the NJC. I was on the NJC for six years and it was an absolute disaster. Apart from the executive head, there's nobody in the NJC who is senior enough to understand judicial policy. And the first uh, CJ, in, in my view, that understood judicial policy was the late Justice Dahiru Mustafa, at which point the rot pointed out by uh, Mr. Justice Datijo Mohammed had festered. In fact, Justice Uwaifu had referred to it in his own valedictory speech in 2004. So it's a long-standing problem, and I'm sure that uh, finally, because every of the retiring justices of the Supreme Court, they have the occasion to, you know, say a final farewell in what is called the valedictory. But I think uh, Mr. Justice Datijo Muhammad was the one who has put it absolutely squarely, and I support what he has said. For instance, the welfare, look what he said about judges, uh, justices receiving less 
uh, remuneration than the chief registrar. That tells me that something is obviously very wrong. I know that uh, Justice Nikki Toby had a very miserable life when he left. Justice um, Adigi, the lady judge who left, had no home to go to. So something is wrong when the judiciary through the NGC is receiving about 160 billion naira, and we can't see it. So I think what lesson should be drawn from what Mr. Justice Datijo has said is to implement a report that was uh, put together by the, in my view, perhaps the most reformist CJN in Nigeria. That is the late Justice Dahiru Mustafa. It's a very good report, which, if implemented, would take care of all this. The CJN, and I, I, let me reemphasize that Mr. Justice um, Datijo Mohammed was not referring to the current CJN. He used the, the, he, he, he used the CJN's office and not the personal status of Mr. Justice uh, Ariwola to describe the rot. The Supreme Court is at this time toxic and it ought to change. And the only way to change is to begin to implement the report. One of the problems, I mean, the only thing I'll criticize the CJN for is when he said, we're down to 10. But it's for him to appoint or recommend. The CJN is, as you know, the chair of the Federal Judicial Service Commission. So he's the one who recommends judges. And then he's also chair of the uh, National Judicial Service Commission. So he receives the report he has prepared and implements it. So I don't know what's holding him. There is nothing holding the NJC from filling the, the, the gap and making the judges 21. Every day they keep bickering about workload, but they will not do what they're supposed to do. They have, they now have the budget. So I think the way out of all this, in my personal view, is to just dust up this report that Justice uh, Dahir Mustafa prepared 13 years ago, implement it, and let's see what will happen. Because confidence is needed. The judiciary is suffering from a very low ebb of confidence, which is not good for democracy. And that, that affected the, 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 the recent appeal, the election petition appeal. But as uh, Justice Oputa said, once the Supreme Court pronounces, it's final. So we've all got to respect it and move on from there. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Agbakoba. And since you have talked about this report from 2011, I just brought it. I think it's good for us to resurrect it at this point and discuss some of the outcomes or perhaps recommendations from this report. You yourself sat on one of the subcommittees on uh, justice, integrity, dignity and appointment and tenure of judges. So it'd be great to hear some of the recommendations from this um, committee reports that were made. And then just to take on one of the points you mentioned with regards to the CJN has the power to appoint, at least recommend judges for appointment, especially to the Supreme Court, yet hasn't exercised his powers. Are there specific reasons? You've already talked about you've eliminated the challenge of a budget since a budget has been provided for that. So what could potentially be a reason why um, he's loath to recommend or perhaps appoint judges to the Supreme Court, seeing that they complain? Even Justice um, Amina Oge had talked about that during her valedictory speech about the load, you know, the workload of Supreme Court justices because of the um, numbers sitting currently. But beyond that, I'd like you to also speak on the recommendations from the report of 2011, as you've mentioned? The recommendations of the 2011 report are so wide-ranging, I don't know whether I can, I can recall all of it, except to say, broadly speaking, we took time to were 29 people, mostly all the past presidents, some very senior Supreme Court judges, and past presidents of the uh, Court of Appeal, and we, we, we took time to deliberate and came out with extensive, very extensive. So all the issues that are now toxic in the, in the, in the, in the NJC and the, in the Supreme Court were carefully considered, even how to appoint the CJN. And the most uh, crucial discussion was raised by my good friend, Rotevi Akaridolu, who succeeded me as MBA president. He said, look, unless we tinker with the composition of the NJC, we would make no progress. Because the NJC, as you know, is the highest judicial making organ of the judiciary. But the problem is that the, the CJM appoints virtually everybody. And no one can talk. I remember in one of the meetings, 
uh, when I had a very strong point to make, I was just dismissed. And I thought I had a good point, but there was no one to support me because everybody was afraid of the CJN to whom they owe their appointment. So the democratization of the institutions of the judiciary. CJN is the chair of the NJI, that's the, the National Judicial Institute. He is the chair of the NIA, sorry, the NILES. He is chair of the Legal Practitioners Privileges Committee. He's chair of everything. So there's a dictatorship. In fact, of the three arms of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judicature, the most undemocratic is actually the judiciary. So that's where the problem is. So what I would recommend to the current NJC is to have a very good look at the report, update it, and absolutely remove the powers of the CJN to be everywhere. And the other thing that I need to say is that we often criticize the judiciary. But you know the judiciary comprises of judges across Nigeria. I've once had the misfortune of appearing before a judge under a tree. And I know of many cases where judges work so hard that when there's no NEPA, they use their, their phone lights to continue. So let's not vilify the judiciary generally. The problem is at the NJC. In the NJC, the first day I walked in, I thought I was walking into a five-star hotel. The difference between what goes on in the NJC buildings and a typical courtroom is outstanding, horrible. So we need to flatten this. The difference between a judge of the high court and the CJN is like God in heaven and somebody on earth. We need to really, really take the opportunity of the lesson, I think, that the teacher Muhammad, Muhammad's valedictory, which has been the most candid, has given us is to understand where we are with the judiciary. And if we want to reverse judicial failure, then the NJC, the current NJC, must implement it. So can we say that makes sense with all of the other things? And that Tijo quoted you about the Emo case and the Hakmed Lawan case. And we also have a country where yes. Senator Bukachua also made affirmations as regards that. So does all of this now tie in to even decisions made by the Supreme Court? Because if you are talking about 741,000 Naira in modern day Nigeria as earnings, then what becomes even of the court system? What country are we running? Mm, yeah, so uh, let's keep two things you know, uh, separate. The funding issue has improved substantially. I mean, for the last 30 years, but, I've but been it's not at the forefront with other, you know... But it's not reflective. It isn't because... It's not reflective. A, the, yeah, I agree with you because there's a mafia. I agree entirely. It, 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 is, the money, is the money being distributed? I know of judges who have passed on as a result of critical illness. Is it reflecting? It is not. So that's the point I'm making. So on the budget, we need to have a democratic process whereby the funding is spread and not just retained. Do you know, for instance, that when a Supreme Court judge retires, he leaves his house to nowhere. The hmm. only person who gets housing in the Supreme Court is actually the CJN. He has a choice of two houses, one in Abuja and probably one in his home state. And sometimes they run, this runs into billions. And I was on the NGSC questioning, where would this be? What about the other judges? So that's part of why the situation in the Supreme Court has become so toxic. And it is what uh, Mr. Justice Datijor Mohammed was referring to. The only judge, the first, because the CJN is seen as the baba of the uh, judicial process. But the first judge, who now got a real kick, to say no, constitutionally, I, Mr. Justice Salami, am the head of the electoral uh, courts. Of the, but uh, uh, Kasina Alu said no, I'm the Baba of the courts, and that caused the quarrel. So you see, 
it goes back to this issue of we need democracy in the judicial institutions. The institutions that Mr. Just, uh, Justice Datijo Mohammed referred to, uh, that the CJN, and I don't refer to this one, please, that the CJN controls, it's a retirement, it's a job for the boys. The guys who get there to do the work are already tired. If you go to the NJI, tired. Whilst we need to put in people, young guys, vibrant, to shake up the system. The rules of court, if, for instance, Justice Amber of the colonial system of 1874 were to come to Nigeria, he will recognize the system. There's no change. And we discussed that in one of the committees where I was a deputy chair, the Committee on Speed of Justice. The rules of court are so slow, and it takes about 20 years to resolve cases. So what type of confidence would you have in that process? The only time you see speed is when uh, you are referring to political cases. So the politicians, knowing that they need speed, have designed a special rule for themselves so that their cases go fast. What about the ordinary person? So these are all the challenges I so, think. So, so the that's why I also want to refer really you. to sit down. I want to refer you to yes. the way Dr. Uh, Justice Datijo quoted you when he talked about the Ahmed Lawan case and the Emo case. I want you yes. to talk through that because right. that's also a serious, <laughs> serious one for our country. If so we I, truly want to build a country, or we want to build a joke. <laughs> Rufa, you want to put me in trouble. You know, I would like I, to put you in I, trouble. I, I gave an interview time. that... <laughs> I get, it was a bad decision, period. It was a bad decision. And that's from the Supreme Court. The, that's from the, the Supreme Court. I, I agree with you, Rufai. It was a bad decision. That's the much I will say. It was a bad decision. And we know that even Mr. Justice Datijo said it in his uh, valedictory. Just kind of explain some of the decisions. They're irrational. And if they're irrational, the public will begin to say, do we, what sense do we make of what the Supreme Court is saying? And that's where public opinion comes in, sir. In the time of our... That's where public opinion becomes absolutely important agree with you. in society. Absol absolutely. Public opinion of the judiciary is at its lowest ebb. And I think that this is something that the judiciary ought to take very serious. They ought to take the points made by Mr. J uh, Justice Datijo Mohammed extremely serious. It's, you know, every other day or every other year, some retiring Supreme Court justice would make a valedictory. And you recall that Justice uh, Datijo Mohammed was even saying, should I even bother? But he was persuaded by his family. No, history will not remember you kindly if you do not speak. That was the context in which he spoke, and he spoke very frankly. So again, I return to the point because everything he said, I agree with. It is simply for the judiciary to say what Justice Datiju Muhammad has said is a very important point and we need to take it very serious. Otherwise, the judiciary is going to go downhill. Well, Mr. Bakuba, there seems to be a general consensus that we need judicial reform and that you know, we also need constitutional amendment. However, I thought that last year, around uh, June, or so, yes, last year, mm -hmm. the uh, FJSC had a short list of judges who were supposed to uh, uh, go to the, uh, to the Supreme Court bench, majorly uh, justices of the Court of Appeal. Whatever happened to that uh, process? Mm -hmm. Because a list was even <laughs> published. It's, it's part of the talk. Yes, it's part of the toxic mafia. You know, we've been pushing to have members of the ben, uh, sorry, bar get onto the uh, Supreme Court. Actually, I and uh, Wale Oladi Bago were the first to actually offer ourselves in the time of Mr. Justice uh, uh, Muhammad Lawal Owais. But there is something against us, period. There is something against b b lawyers coming onto the bench. So I was part of the last um, interview process concerning eligible uh, lawyers who wanted to apply to the, to, the, to the senior bench, both the Court of Appeal and the uh, Supreme Court. And that's the last we heard of it. 
In fact, I, I, I came out of bed with heavy malaria to, to do this. That was the last we heard of it. The only thing I can make of this is that to do the, because we put a lot of pressure, to do a list, a short list of nominees that will exclude the bar. I don't think the Supreme Court has the bollocks to do it. And that's why you now have only 10. And very soon it will be six. So it's time for the Supreme Court, the NJC, and the powers that be in the judiciary to recognize that they would be far better off to have academia, to have barristers, and of course judges. We respect the fact that they are the ones who, having had a long ride from the High Court to the Court of Appeal, are best suited. But I don't see that they would not be benefiting from the wisdom of us as practitioners in joining the Supreme Court. So that's the politics going on. Because when the CJN, by the way, the 18th CJN, the current one, sat on the bench saying, uh, we don't know why, they, why our numbers are depleting. I was just look, I was watching him on TV and <laughs> having a big laugh. Say, but you, you have the power to do this. It is for you to set the process in motion. FJAC, you are the chair, so you put the motion in and you bring in the relevant suitable candidates and you send it up to the NJC and that's it. So it's simple, ABC. It's not rocket science. So why is he, comp why is he moaning? as if he doesn't have the power. Is it the president of Nigeria or the president of the Senate? The power to appoint judges squarely resides with the NJC and the FJC. So could the judges stop complaining that their numbers are depleting when it is their duty to fill up the gap? But because they want to exclude people from the bench, so, so, sorry, from, from the bar and academia, that's why this dilemma is coming. So maybe we'll get to a point where there are only two judges, Supreme Court judges, the <laughs> CJN and maybe the, the CJN. Maybe we'll come to that point. Oh, yeah, because right. that's what it is. We'll come to that point. All right. They are, going, they are, they are, they are, they are bound to put us on the bench. Mm. Well, I don't mean me. I'm too old now. I'm 71, so I'm not qualified. But they are bound to. There's people like Idiwe them who want to be on the bench. And they will contribute All very right. effectively. All right, very important point um, you've made this morning, Mr. Bakoba, and I, I would just like us to take, I would like to take you back to that 2011 report because um, I, I've yeah. extracted a few of the recommendations, especially as it pertains uh, to corruption, because that was one of the um, terms of references under consideration and which a subcommittee was set up for. And yeah. it seems like the issues that plagued or what were the, with what were the challenges in 2011 still exist today in 2023, about um, 12 years later, and he hasn't yet been addressed. And so you wonder why they haven't implemented this. One of the things that um, recommendation from the committee was to have a special investigation intelligence unit to investigate on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> allegations of corruption or bribery where it exists. You also, there was also the recommendation as to and which you already talked about, better welfare remuneration for the judges to make perhaps corruption or bribery less attractive to um, their, their justices. Unfortunately, th this doesn't seem to have been done 12 years later. There was also um, a recommendation to um, engender, to provide an ombudsman, uh, the idea of an ombudsman yeah. perhaps was also mooted ombudsman, by that yes, ombudsman, yes, yet, yes, mooted yes, by that committee. Yes. What's the status on that? And then you begin to yes. wonder why were not these recommendations taken forward? Because when you read the full report, it makes common sense in terms of the reform of the judiciary system. But why haven't these recommendations been taken forward? And 12 years later, we still have the same challenges being faced by the judiciary. You asking me? I, I, I'm not the CJ. <laughs> not, Maybe perhaps not, let, let me let me couch the I, question I I, differently. I, what's what are the steps? What steps? So what what's the role of the legislature? Because I, I believe that in some cases there would be some um, there, there's legislature would need to come in in terms of laws um, changing or mod, um, um, amendments to perhaps um, laws and statutes. What what who who takes responsibility beyond the CJN? Who are the people to be held accountable 
mm. to ensure that these recommendations do come to life? As it stands now, it's the NJC, because the NJC has the constitutional power mm. to administer justice. But I think I see a space for legislative intervention. But you see, the problem with that intervention is that it might then go and affect independence of the judiciary, which is exactly what happened when the Advisory Judicial Committee was set up under the military. So it's not a very easy question. But my point, I, I, I really get your point. How, how, how do we resolve all this? I think if you look at the ages of the members of the NJC and the Supreme Court, it's probably about 500 years old, five, if you put them together. So why can't they just get the work done? Why would a report of, of 13 years still be outstanding? I spent about six months, morning and evening, killing myself to produce a report for the late Justice Dahiru Mustafa on speed of justice. It's lying down there in the, in the, in the, in the NJC. When I raised it with uh, the only female CJN, Aluma Mukta, she was not interested. I wasn't interested. So what happened was that when Dahiru Mustafa left, all the work he did ended. The first important reforms actually started, was started by Mr. Justice Belgore. Do you know there was a time when the NBA was absolutely crippled financially because the Supreme Court took all our money? Took all our money. We, we had no access to it. It was Justice Belgore that reformed a lot of processes that even brought credibility and democracy to the relationship between the NBA and the NJC and the Supreme Court. That was a very good time. Before his time was Mr. Justice Waste. That, that was the calm period of the Supreme Court and the NJC. Everybody respected him. But like um, we've pointed out, there's a big difference between administration of justice and justice administration. Judges have no clue how to, ad how, how to administer. And that's why the formula in Lagos worked, because there was collaboration between three key people. BF, that is uh, Babatunde, uh, uh, um, uh, Fashola as governor who was a son and the former vice president who was attorney general and uh, the current president and the CJN all of them came together and agreed that we this thing we need a new we need a new system and it worked and that's why today you have the Lagos judiciary at the top of things in Nigeria that is a sort of collaboration I'd like to see. I'd like to see my dear friend uh, Latif Fabwemi play some sort of strong okay. role. <clears throat> and the point you indicate about, okay. is there something that can be done to co collaboratively? The executive, the legislature, okay. and the judiciary. Because if we leave this thing to the judiciary, I don't know what will happen. Okay. Uh, the report of uh, the valedictory speech of, yeah? Go ahead, finish up, sir, before I say, put the input. You're going to say... No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Finish up. Uh, no, I was going to say the the the, the valedictory speech of um, Justice Owaifo is twenty years old, and there have been several. Now, Datijo's speech has just come out. So, when will we get to implement? That's the big question. I don't have the answers. Okay, so I have the answers for you, sir, and I'll tell you what you guys have been doing all this Thank while. Thank you. What you all have been doing all this okay. while is what we call strategy. But to be able to get the answer. You need culture. That's the part all of you have missed all this while. So when you say the Supreme Court is toxic, you are saying the culture is toxic. And this is the hard work. Maybe we should now start introspecting on how we can build culture. What you wrote, uh, Dr. Uh, Justice uh, Dahiru's paper, is strategy. It's not gonna work because culture will eat strategy for breakfast. So probably now is the time to now have the cultural conversation. Because everything human beings do is couched around culture, a systematic way of life. 
that you've become accustomed to. You wrote a fine paper as regards bringing technology to hasten speedy delivery of justice. You said, just Aluma Mukha, throw it away. She doesn't have the culture of technology, didn't you get it? So she was never going to implement it or look at it in the first place. So can we take out from here, having the culture conversation, which spans over decades, mm. over the years, is this something you want to start couching in your conversations now? Because we can write documents from now to that kingdom come. I'm sure you've written tons of them. <laughs> and it's never going to work. <laughs> yeah. Is it the time to yes. look at the culture conversation? Well, you see, uh, Rufa, good point. <laughs> good point, except that I have, no, I have no power. You know, I'm just, looking down, I'm just looking down the list of, you know, Nigerian CJs. You know, I see uh, Justice... Uh, Stafford Foster Sutton, who was the only white man. Culture was there. They understood. My dad, my dad never received a visitor when he was the chief judge, judge of um, uh, East Central State. That was the culture. You just don't mix. That was the culture. Then you had Adetukubu Ademola. Culture. Then you went on to uh, who? You went on to Taslim Elias. Culture. But then Daniel Alexander. At, uh, Fatai Williams. These were the guys of culture. But look at the culture now, today. Slowly it broke down. It's broke down. Look at the culture today where well, that's the, the CGN speaks in, <laughs> in, in, in a dinner organized by politicians. <laughs> and we saw it. <laughs> <laughs> well, who do you blame? I agree with you, Rufai. But who do you blame? <laughs> you, are you blaming me for that? Is that possible? The yeah. culture has to return. Yeah. At some point, you made this good. What was it that? What was it that told my dad, after coming home from work, that he sits at home and he doesn't go anywhere? It was the culture. There was that insulation that we in, we, we inherited from the departing colonials. It's all gone. You find judges now going to parties and dancing. You find them everywhere. You find them in the supermarkets. So how do we rebuild that culture? I, again, even though I take your point, it's for the powers that be. I'm no longer, a, I'm no longer in the hierarchy of, 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 of the structure of power in the judiciary. So there's nothing I can do except to talk, which I've been doing. So it is for those who are there to say, this point that has been made by Datiju Muhammad, we need to take it serious. We need to take it serious. And this is the report of... Um, uh, the, C, the late CJN, uh, Dahiru Mustafa. Let them look at it. What is the difficulty? This 18th CJN, I challenge him. Look so at this report and implement it. If he needs help, we're there to help. But there's nothing we can do other than what I'm doing now, talking about it, writing papers, writing letters. I have written to every single CJN since I left the NJC. The only one that replied to me was actually the, uh, Mr. Justice Onogen, just Mr. to acknowledge. Mr. He didn't say anything beyond uh, acknowledgement. Mr. So that's the challenge. Mr. And Bakker. I'm sure that my brothers uh, who, who, who have been president of the MBA will have the same story. Mr. Bakuba, just to manage time, we seem to be running out of time. Two things. Yes. One of the points raised sure. by uh, Justice uh, Datijo was that, look, he was retiring. That would mean the North Central will no longer have anybody on the bench. And then that the uh, uh, Southeast, uh, following the uh, uh, death of uh, Justice Nwese, uh, you know, does not have anybody yes. on the uh, Supreme Court. Should that be a reason why anybody should be disdainful of the Supreme Court ruling in the presidential election petition? That's one. Two, okay, this is at page 22 of... Uh, of Justice Datijo's speech. I'll just read it out and then I'll like your comment on it. It says, recently, fresh allegations have been made that children and other relatives of serving and retired judges and justices are being appointed into judicial offices at the expense of more qualified candidates lacking in such privilege and backing. It is asserted that the process of appointment to judicial positions are deliberately conducted 
to give undue advantage to the children, spouses, and mistresses of serving and retired judges and <laughs> managers of judicial offices. In that regard, do you, do you have anyone in mind? Because it's clear in window. Uh, do, do you know some of these, <laughs> some of these uh, uh, children and spouses and mistresses who have been appointed to the bench? And who I did know. that, if not the CJN? Ruben, 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 I know a lot, but I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of them because <laughs> I won't tell you. Because both of us, both you, Arise, and me will be sued for libel. But I know them. <laughs> they are flooding the... They are flooding the judiciary. They are flooding in different names. So if I'm Olisa Bakoba, I put in my kid as some other name. I put my kid as uh, maybe uh, Ruben and all that. We know that. It's been going on for a long time. It's been going on. So that is the culture that Rufai referred to. It's got to stop. And do you know what? We actually have in place an institutional structure for the appointment of judges. It's not working. It's been in place since 2013. It's in the Constitution. Yeah. You've got it's to publish names, you know, like... Yes, it's a, no, it's a, it's a guideline. Yeah. It's like, you know, a marriage ban. Does anyone have any objection to Lisa Bakoba marrying Lilian Abakoba? Please say. But they don't do it. So that they can smuggle all these people in. On the point whether the... Um, non ...judgment of the Supreme Court in relation to the uh, election thing was was affected by the absence of the Southeast people. Mm. And not central. Well. I would reserve my answer on that, but I don't, I don't really think so. I don't think it would have made a difference. Mm -mm. It wouldn't have made a difference, in my view. All right, um, just let me say... Uh, what it is, the, I think, uh, so go on, sorry. No, no finish your thought, because I'm, I'm about to ask you a question on a different tangent since you're with us on the show today. Well, please go on, on your, and finish that statement. No, uh, the, actually, I've forgotten the point I wanted to make, to be honest with you. So you go on. All right, okay. So beyond the CJN, um, Mr. Ebuwade Borua, SAN, had also commented on this story, saying that beyond the CJN having absolute power, as it seems, um, we have other institutions like that, or other positions. The presidency, for instance, we often talk about the president liking to a monarch with almost absolute powers in many regards. And also the president of the Senate chairing most of the committees um, in, the, in, 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 the, in, in the legislature. So we have a problem. And, and I guess it goes back to that question or perhaps that conversation around culture, whereby power is vested mm. in a particular individual occupying a particular position and there's no will, political or otherwise, to change it because it suits the person who is in power at that point. And that's why I asked the question around how does right. change then begin? How do we begin to change? Because you, I mean, you were saying, how could you, would you answer that question if the CJN himself enjoys the powers that have been bestowed on him? The president enjoys the power that has been bestowed on him. Mm. Same with the Senate president. How do we then begin to change? What is the hope um, of change in that regard? That was what I was going to just um, take your thoughts on that. And then whilst you're here, because there's breaking news there, just mm. as it flashed across the uh, screen there, about what's going on in River State, the situation in River State with the majority leader of the State House of Assembly now suspended, calling for the impeachment of the River State Governor. I'm sure you followed or perhaps would have um, heard what's going on there. Mm. And I'd like to get your comment on that as well, since you're with us on the show this morning. Mm. Yeah. Oh, so in the first, quest first part of your question, Professor Mwabez has written on this point ad nauseum. It's called the notion of limited government. So the Constitution limits the power of institutions, and that is what is called the rule of law. But I once gave a talk at a retreat, I think it was um, the time of uh, uh, the late Yaradwa, and I remember joking with Timi Alaibe, do we really respect the rule of law? So that if my power were limited by the Constitution, do I care about it? The powers of the President is limited. The powers of all senior government officials, whether it's the president of Senate, the, whoever is in government, is limited. But the culture is of impunity. So you have impunity versus the rule of law. And where are the people, we, the so-called voters, that we can do the changes? 
We have a, an ineffective, completely decrepit INEC that has put us in all this trouble. And by the way, I don't think P2B and uh, Atiku and, um, and uh, Tinubu should worry about anything between themselves. If you read the petitions, a lot of the complaint was against INEC. Not, not, not interpersonal, against INEC. And we're all here sitting down. So until we begin to address how do we really get credible, free, transparent elections, the votes don't count. And if the votes don't count, these guys in Abuja feel that they're above the law. So until we begin to have credible elections and make people realize that if you misbehave, there's a consequence, then there'll be a problem. On Rivers, oh, are you surprised? <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised are you asking me this question. The whole place is in a mess. You, 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 you shoot yourself into power as best as you can. Once I was asked, I think 20 years ago, whether I was interested in being a senator or a governor. I said, hmm, not a bad idea. But they, they then asked me, what if you were told that uh, some of the, your opponents were carrying off your ballot papers on their heads and running off? What would you do? <laughs> would you give an order to shoot them? I said, I wouldn't do that. Too. They said, well, you're not qualified to be a Nigerian politician. So there's a lot of wahala that we have to resolve. One of the, one of the biggest, for me, is really credible elections. Credible elections. That is where we will start to rebuild Nigeria. But it goes back to my initial assertion about culture. When you check historically, yes. we have not had ever, from historical times, from the 12th of December 1959, where we had those very first elections, we had not have never had a culture of credible elections in this country, except we want to deceive ourselves. And me, I'm not up for self-deceit. From the 12th of December, 1959, <laughs> we have never had, because if you go back to the 1959 yeah. elections, you remember how those elections were disputed. A lot of shenanigans were reported in that election. And we saw what True. came out of that election. And in fact, the other election we had in 63, 64 was just a consolidation of the same culture of lack of credible election. We all remember how some regions didn't have the election at the same time, and we went a long haul. Mm -hmm. And it led to wet here in the southwestern region. It became wild, wild west. Yeah. True, true. So, mm -hmm. where are we going to start bringing about this culture? It's another problem. Because you blame INEC. INEC will only do something that Profile. it has a cultural disposition to do. So we are mm -hmm. blaming INEC, mm -hmm. but we are not also blaming the culture mm -hmm. that brings about INEC in the first place. I will give you your argument. I'm not, right. I know where you are going to get me the argument is this. You will say, but we had an outlier in Muhammad Ujega. Yes. But you see, when it comes to these culture games, we cannot afford outliers because they will not come too often. We cannot afford the 2015 episode because they will not come too often. It must be a culture that everybody collectively participates in. So why do we want INEC to change mm -hmm. when we have a culture of elections that we're never free and fair in the first place? Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you're forcing me to pose a very difficult question. And that question was asked by the late Bola Ige. And he said, there are two important things that we need to look at. The first question, and these are things that we must begin to discuss realistically. Do we really want to be a country? Do we really want to be a country called Nigeria? Number one. Number two, if we do, what are the arrangements? Because I think that is also central to this problem. Do we want to be a country? If yes, how? I vote personally that I'd like to be in a large country called Nigeria, but I'm not satisfied with the arrangements. So maybe if we begin to, and then you look at all the conferences, going back to the time of OBJ, to the one I, I, I served under uh, Jonathan, nothing. Jonathan conference held in 2014, nothing, no outcomes. 
So, you see, our mothers would say, no, a prophet, and I appreciate the tough questions you ask in reply, but I have absolutely got no answers. Just I'm worried that having been in this struggle for 40 years, when I was about 30, I'm now 70, by, by 10 years I'm 80, and you, you refer, will be a young man. Where are we going? That's the point. Where, where, where are we headed? I'm absolutely disturbed and worried about what's going on. I think one of my daughters, without even telling me, Jabad, do that day. And do you blame her for, for that? This is an absolutely decrepit country, no rules, no regulations. I just got a letter from uh, my, my dear brother, Femi Falada, you know, about stolen money, billions. What's happening? We say we are poor. So you see, it, it, the, judicial, the judicial thing is one, one hand. But there are several things. Are we really a country? That's the issue. Well, well, are we really a country? Mama. Let's be honest about that. Let's go to Bolaige's question. How do we resolve that question? Because if we're not a country, this is just a waste of time. It's a chop-chop game. Anyone who is there just chops and says, what do I, what, 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 how does this concern me? Sir, it's but if we want to be a country, then we will build the institutions. It's called turn by turn. Turn by turn. <laughs> That's what we do in Nigeria. Yeah, turn by turn. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Ruben. Yes. Ruben. You got it. And if it's, if, if it's turn by turn, I don't know. My brother, wait for your talk. <laughs> anyway, I wanted uh, your take on the PNID case, which was uh, determined recently yes. by the Commercial Court in London. And some of the submissions yes. uh, along the lines of fraud and public policy uh, by Justice Knowles. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, uh, incidentally, I'm the chair of the National Arbitration Policy committee set up by Mr. Malami on the back of the PNID case. Well, again, it's part of the culture of lack of interest. How could two men come into the country, just show us a PowerPoint, and get away with a very big contract with the federal government and the federal, federal Ministry of Justice officials absolutely bungling it? And it is to the great wisdom of Justice Knowles that he detected that this was not the proper thing to do. It was such a humongously embarrassing case for Nigeria. And I'm very happy that it's gone the way it has in our favor and we've been freed from that liability. But there are about a thousand other cases. This is the only one. This is the popular one. There are so many cases around the world against Nigeria. So I call on the Attorney General to set up a panel so that we can study these cases and we know exactly what our li potential liabilities are. As I, tell, as, as I speak, our liabilities on potential awards exceed our foreign reserves. So it's a very serious problem. And God saved us that we got out of this. And this is only the third time in English history that an award is upset. You don't, have, you don't obtain an award in the English system because the sanctity of an arbitration award is so valuable. And that's why the English arbitration jurisdiction is one of the most effective in the world. But I think on the evidence that you know, uh, the judge saw, he knew that this couldn't stand. And I'm happy for Shubo, my dear friend, that he's been exonerated from the initial uh, 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 scandal that uh, trailed his name. Yes, indeed, Shrupa Shashore SAN was uh, singled out for special praise by the court. We'd like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lisa Bakuba SAN, for joining us this morning on The Morning Show.